The fact is, is that many organizations, and it really doesn't matter what size they are, big or small, many of them don't have a good, strong understanding of risk, risk management, or how it impacts the business. Um, so the risk visibility and reporting is actually very low in those organizations. Now, I, I, you know, with all of the exploits that are being discussed on the news right now, um, almost it, it's almost a daily, if not certainly a weekly event, where some exploit, some vulnerability has caused a major disruption or a loss of confidentiality, with that being reported on, you know, CNN, NBC, all, all of the different news organizations all the time, this level of visibility is starting to rise quickly. But but the reasons for the original low visibility still are there, which is. A lot of organizations and the key uh, stakeholders in the organization, senior management, they just don't understand um, what risk and ri risk management is and how these vulnerabilities impact them. They know that if something goes wrong, it's bad, but they don't necessarily know how to solve the problem. And this is where you as a security professional and in information security can be helpful. Now, I do want to say that if you're in an organization that doesn't have a lot of formalized risk management, you may have parts of it in different places, but not a, a, a larger formalized process. It's really hard to start it from the ground up. In fact, it really has to start from the very top, but you can help provide the information. And that's some of the things that we want to look at. First of all, you want to start to take a look at an enterprise risk management ERM, in which is the process of identifying, assessing those risks, and then reducing those risks through a series of controls. Now, there are formalized processes for this, and we're going to, throughout this course, take you through some of those standardized, formalized processes. But each organization may take control of its own processes and make some changes to how it once conducted. Now, through an enterprise risk management, this will help change the culture of a reactive to proactive. And in IT, we, you know, there's a lot of folks that are very reactive. In other words, there's something that, um, that fails, uh, a server fails, network switch fails, we have an outage and we react to that. And what we find is in a lot of cases that we're reacting to something that may have been able to be prevented. In other words, had we spent the time being proactive and prevented that failure from occurring, then we wouldn't have had the loss. In other words, we have controls in place, we would have reduced the loss that would have occurred. And that puts us in a very proactive place to be in. What we want is not just IT to be that way, we want the entire business culture to become that way. And as a business starts to implement a, a formalized risk management process, this is one of the things that starts to occur. And of course, this is going to help the organization both forecast and mitigate risk. And while we you and I are focused on IT and security, uh, risk evaluation. The organization has many other risks that it needs to look at in other parts of the organization. And so this overall process can help them. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, this must be undertaken at the organization level by the senior managers and stakeholders, because there's so much to this formalized process that if you are new to the organization and at a lower level in the organization, you just don't have the authority to conduct some of these exercises. It requires time and money and additional staff in order to be able to do this. So it's got to start at the very top. And it's going to involve everything that you can imagine from employee training to doing risk identification, which we're going to get into here in just a few minutes across the entire organization, not just from an information security or IT standpoint, how what kind of incidents and response reporting and what kind of monitoring and we're going to be talking a lot about in this course, continuous monitoring. And I said at the very beginning in the introduction, I'm going to try not to talk too much about it before we get there. But monitoring, once we have the risk management process in place is one of the most important components of it. So by implementing an enterprise risk management process, this can move the organization to be able to predict and be able to identify and deal with these vulnerabilities and events that can occur that would cause loss. So what do you say we start to dive deeper into what these risk management concepts are?
For risk management concepts, we're going to start off with defining some terminology. But first, let's start with this. The management process is the method by which an organization needs to create its policies and then implement its tools and controls to identify, evaluate, and control risk. Now, what's important to understand here is that the management process is a business function. It's very important to the organization, and this is an important concept even for the exam, is that it's not about having a, a risk management process for IT or risk management process for information security. It's the business risk management process, and it matters to the business because it directly affects the entire organization. So it's a business function is what it boils down to. Now there's a couple of concepts that we need to start to work with. One of them is assets. And so as we start having conversations, we're even going to do some calculations, we have to think about the assets of the organization. And these are these are any resources. And this is a very generic term, right? Any resources that the organization needs in order to perform its business. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of assets involved in this. And we have a couple of, of terms we want to kind of think of as we think of this tangible assets and intangible assets. Now a tangible asset well, that's basically anything you can grab hold of, right? It's a server, it's a network device, it's, you know, the, the, the storage for your confidential data, it's, you know, um, an application that's providing a service. So it, it, it's also, it's the buildings themselves, it's your offices, um, it's the furniture, it's your, and here's a, a nifty one, it's your documentation about all of the assets. That's what a tangible asset is. But then we have intangible assets, and this is where it's it's harder to grab hold of with intangible assets. Um, things like intellectual property or the information about trade secrets, these intangible assets are things that are in the minds of the people. The processes that people go through to achieve certain business goals or mission goals, these things are, are part of that intellectual property. These are intangible assets. And it can involve more than that. It could be the policies and contracts and agreements. While there are pieces of paper for this, there could be unwritten policies and agreements that are out there that matter to the operations of the business. And one important note here is a lot of these intangible assets rest with the people of the corporation. And what you should think about is the most important asset overall it are the people in the organization and they have to be protected at all costs. And I wanna give you an example. And this is one of those times when this is not a fun example to, to use. As a matter of fact, this is a rather horrific example, but when we're dealing in IT and, in, and especially in security, we sometimes have to have conversations about things that aren't comfortable. And so this one is about the events that occurred on 9-11. On and the businesses that were in the Twin Towers, and I am, am talking about just the operations of the business, while some of those businesses did have storage, uh, offsite storage of their data, it's the personnel loss that impacted those companies, sometimes the greatest, to the point to where those companies could not recover. In other words, they didn't recover. And we've seen this in other environments where the loss of people to an organization, whether you know, they just leave to go to a different job, can sometimes impact the organization greatly. So these intangible assets are as important as the tangible assets and people are the most important. Now, when we start thinking about what's most important to the effect of the organization, that's when we're going to start ranking those assets. So part of when we're doing the asset analysis, when we're thinking about these assets, and what their values are, we have to start ranking them. People are always at the top, but there are other things that will follow. There'll, there could be a lot of tangible assets that are part of your mission critical business operation. Well, mission critical, such as well, think about email, email is kind of mission critical, right? If the email system goes down, a lot of people have a tendency to stop working because they can't function in their jobs. There might be particular applications providing uh, services to customers that put a screeching halt to the business. So we rank those assets. And that'll help us start to decide what things if we lose them would jeopardize the business. Now, what kind of things 
are going to impact our assets that are going to cause these losses. Oh, and I just want to remind you, the most important asset is people. Now, the things that can impact this, these are the threats that we need to think about. Any event that can cause harm to the organization's assets is a threat. But let's define the term threat a little bit more clinically. So threat agents, vectors, and actions. And here's how uh, to think about it. Let's say that there's an action that can occur, the actual event itself, which is a power outage. Now, a power outage at my organization is going to have impact to the organization. The servers could shut down, uh, availability of services and applications become unavailable. And the, the action of losing power is going to cause me a problem. How did that get to me? How did I lose power? And that's what our threat vector is. Well, let's say it was caused due to high winds. And what was the agent of those high winds? Could have been a hurricane or a really bad storm. Now, it's not the hurricane that I'm trying to resolve with my 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 risk management. It's the I'm losing power. What do I do about that to prevent losing power? In other words, when I'm doing my risk management, I'm looking at the loss of power and trying to find controls that will mitigate that. I could put in backup generators as an example in the event that power is lost. Now, when you think about the threat agents, other th hurricanes cause other things. They cause heavy rain. Now, heavy rain could be a vector that causes flooding in my business and flooding can cause damage to, you know, furniture, you know, documentation, paperwork, printers, devices, so you see how we're looking at these threats is not just who is causing it, but how does the event get to me? And what is the actual action of that event once it's there? Because that's what I can plan for. And that's what I can start to do triage on. And that's what my risk management is all about. Now, that's not to say that, you know, I'm not going to think about the threat agents, a hurricane. In fact, I'm going to think about that particular agent. Because if the business is in an area where we can predict that we're going to have four hurricanes a year, that's going to be added to the equation. As you see, when I said equation, you can see a little bit later here in the course, we're going to show you how to calculate some of this. And that probability is going to be a factor. How often do you think this is possibly going to occur in the year? And if the threat agent is a hurricane, well, you can look at the, you know, farmer's almanac or past, you know, results and kind of gauge how often this particular thing might, this event might occur. Now, threats can also be human created. And I've already mentioned this a little bit, but you can have insider threats and external threats that are human based. I had mentioned Sony um, as an example uh, of, of having uh, what is currently believed to be an insider threat they had, uh, where somebody um, had maliciously uh, confiscated confidential data and then made it public. So insider threats are people that have access to very sensitive information, confidential information. They also may have the ability to get access. As a matter of fact, think about this. There's a lot of people working inside of the company that may have accounts and passwords that could allow them to do things that would be, well, would cause an event for the organization that would be, you know, an exploit or a risk that would get confidential data out. Um, external threats, well, that's just what you think it's gonna be hackers coming after it. Now, as I use that Sony case, the original thought was that it was hackers from North Korea had, had broken into, and that means they had to find an exploit from the outside and find a way to penetrate the network. They didn't have, the inside information. As a matter of fact, now that you kind of see the difference between insider threats and external threats, you can see why a lot of the security professionals at the time of the Sony hack were saying, no, it's got to be an insider's job because to get to this particular information that was so targeted and so specific required knowledge that only an internal person would have. So these kind of threats can occur to us. They can be, you know, environmental based, they can be human based, which is both external and internal. Um, so these are the threats that we're looking out for. Now, while those threats exist, we need to then start to determine what some of those vulnerabilities that could be exploited by those threats would be. So vulnerabilities are flaws or just weaknesses that can be attacked or exploited by a threat. So whether it's a human threat or an environmental threat that is going to try to exploit a particular vulnerability. In the case of high winds, if we have 
weak power lines, those are going to get exploited, as an example. Um, now, vulnerabilities can be intentional, which would be a willful act. And I want you to kind of think about this. An intentional vulnerability is something that someone has intentionally created as a vulnerability. Um, an example would be maybe a programmer has put a back door into their code that snuck by code review. And when that particular application goes out or gets updated, that back door can now be used for possibly, you know, ill gotten purposes, um, you know, in bad ways. So that's an intentional act. Uh, that's an intentional vulnerability that got created. A lot of times, and most of the time, it's an un unintentional vulnerability. So it's a defect. Um, and you hear about this all the time. It, it wasn't that there was an intentional person uh, or organization behind it. It was an accident. So sometimes we discover vulnerabilities in software, like your operating system or an application that everybody was unaware that existed. So a lot of our security updates are to kind of plug up those particular unintentional vulnerabilities that were created. And it created without will, it was just a defect. You hear about this all the time on the news, maybe your car has been recently recalled, because it had a defect that could cause an accident and they wanted to fix that defect. Now recently, we've heard about VW cars, many of VW's cars had an intentional vulnerability, they did not uh, produce the the environmental results that the engines were actually producing. In other words, when you went in to get your uh, environmental impact done for your license and registration, um, the computer would adjust itself when being tested to produce false results. And then when you went out driving it, it would retune the engine to drive in a more favorable manner. That's an intentional vulnerability and a willful act, as opposed to many of the, the like the car recalls, your software updates and patches for both security and for other reasons are unintentional vulnerabilities. Now, how do we deal with these vulnerabilities? And we've actually spent the first two courses in this series talking quite about this. It's the use of controls and controls are the mechanisms that are going to allow us to reduce the risk of vulnerability. Now, again, we're never going to be able to get to 100% where things aren't going to go wrong, but controls will allow us to do this. And let me give you an example. So let's uh, say, for instance, um, you have a network that's connected to the internet, you want to reduce the amount of, of hacking that can occur on different ports uh, to different applications that could come into your network. So you put a firewall up that will block certain ports so that people cannot try to exploit them. That firewall is your control mechanism. And it has it pro provides a certain amount of reduction to the risk at a certain level of cost. And again, see, I'm starting to set you up for calculations, because we're going to do some calculations here in a little bit. Now, in earlier courses, we, we broke down and talked about the types of controls mainly administrative, uh, which are the policies and procedures and the guidelines that are put in place of both the selection of controls and how the controls are handled. The technical controls um, themselves, uh, which would be hardware and software to prevent a particular um, attack, like a firewall in the example I just gave. And then physical controls, things that will stop people or vehicles from going from one location to another. In other words, eh, let's not overthink this a door with a lock on it. <laughs> um, and then compensating controls are another type of controls. Compensating controls are there as backups, they um, will compensate if the primary control doesn't perform its job or if it fails. In an instance, in a lot of networks, it's very common to have two tiers of firewalls between the internet and the 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 private uh, servers for the business and it creates different areas. Um, but it's common to have two firewalls in case one fails or doesn't have the correct access control list on it. The second one can compensate for it. Now with all of these definitions of assets and threats and vulnerabilities and controls, what does an organization do with that information now to start to build upon risk management? And that's where we're going to take a look at next moving into the actual risk assessment.
risk assessment is part of your risk management process. And remember what we were saying is that this starts from the organization top and works itself down. And that's how we want to implement our risk management. And we'll do a risk assessment, which is the identification of, of not only the assets, but the threats and the vulnerabilities and ways to mitigate them. So we want to identify, look at mitigation, um, incidents response, and then how we're going to monitor this. And that's going to be our risk assessment. Now there's a risk assessment process to go through. And what I'm showing you here is one of the important documents to keep in your mind for the exam and in real life that can discuss these components. So if you want to sit down with a group of managers and talk about this, what you're looking for is the NIST uh, special publication 800-30 Rev 1 will discuss in detail risk assessment. And I encourage you to actually go out and, and give this a, a, a read. Now, the verbiage is kind of thick, but you'll understand it and you can uh, give it a read. I give you the URL there at the bottom, or you can just go to your favorite search engine and look for NIST 800-30 and you'll find it. Um, Rev one. Now the previous revision of this, and just as an exam note, if you were if you had taken the previous exam, this was a a nine step process. It's now a four step process. And before you get too excited thinking, oh wow, they found a way to reduce the steps. Not really. Um, those a lot of those steps are now just part of step two when you conduct the assessment. So let's talk about these steps a little bit here, starting with step one in preparing uh, for the assessment. As we mentioned for an enterprise risk management system, the organization needs to make some decisions. So they need to decide what the purpose of this assessment is. In other words, you know, they, there are many facets to the organization that may need a risk management process information security and IT processes are just some of those They may be financial processes that they have to uh, mitigate risk for there's other operational issues they have to mitigate. So for this risk assessment, the first thing is, is to decide what the purpose and the scope of the assessments going to be and also identify if there's any constraints on this particular assessment. And what I mean by constraints is, is an organization that I worked for had a particular constraint on one of their departments that had to follow certain federal guidelines and their processes were mandated by federal government guidelines and they needed to follow those. They could not follow the other internal ones. So there was a constraint on what that department could or could not do. Also at this level in preparing for the assessment, any decisions that need to be made for what type of risk management model um, is going to be used are usually made at this point. And we're going to be showing you, I'm going to be showing you examples of uh, the risk management framework also by NIST as well a little bit later on that might be one of the models that you use. Now in step two, this is where a lot of the work needs to get done. And so you can see with conducting the assessment, first thing we need to do is start to identify what our threat sources are and what events they can create. So these are our threat agents and the type of actions that are going to happen. So heavy rain or or let's use high winds. High winds can produce a power outage. Heavy rain can produce flooding and create outages that way. And then we're going to start to look at the vulnerabilities um, and how we're going to start to deal with those vulnerabilities. So as we're looking at the vulnerabilities that the organization may have, what impacts to what resources are going to occur with those vulnerabilities? Are any of those vulnerabilities things that we can start to mitigate? And those that mitigation, if we already know it up front, we can start to document the mitigation. Also with those vulnerabilities, we need to understand the likelihood of occurrence. And this is kind of a big deal. We, there's still some definitions we have to look at. And one of them is, is if it's not very likely to occur, how much time and money are we going to spend to try to mitigate it? Well, we probably don't want to spend very much if it doesn't have a likelihood of occurring. But things like power outages, they may in my particular area occur quite a bit. And those things, because of the nature of the event, what it, the loss that it occurs to the company, may be something that we definitely want to try to mitigate. And that's where we get into that next step of determining the magnitude of impact. How does this affect 
the business on its mission or its goals as it's conducting its, it, itself with its customers. And so the bigger the, the magnitude, the more likely is that we need to deal with it. Um, and so that determines our overall risk. Now, this is a point to where we start to move into step three, communicating and sharing this risk assessment information. And we're going to talk a little bit about documentation here in just a few minutes. And part of that documentation is who do I need to communicate this to? So this isn't just, yes, please communicate it, but it defines who am I communicating it to? What is the communication pipeline for this? And who needs to make decisions based upon um, these communications, not only of the risk that we've determined, but of what things we would like to do to mitigate it. And step four is to maintain the assessment. And maintaining the assessment means, and I've always said I'm going to try not to talk about this till we get to it, but the monitoring of, of our uh, uh, assessment. In other words, we things change over time. So the threats and the events that they occur can also change over time. And we know this from, you know, just working with the uh, our operating systems, we have to get updates because there are new vulnerabilities that are found. So we've got to maintain this assessment. And it's a continual process that we have to make sure occurs. And during this phase of the risk assessment, these are the decisions we want to make, how are we going to monitor it? And how often is that going to occur? And as you can see, this is kind of a reiterative process all the way around when we're dealing with the risk assessment. Now, when you do the assessment, we're primarily looking at identifying the threats and events, what vulnerabilities there are, what is the likelihood that there, that, that vulnerability is going to occur or be um, exploited, and the magnitude of the impact, who to communicate it to, and how to continually redo this process. Now, then we move into the phase of mitigation. Now, while some mitigation may be done in here, discussion of mitigation, there's actually a more formalized process called risk treatment. Risk treatment is part of the risk assessment plan in many organizations. However, in some, they treat it as a separate uh, set of documents and a separate process because it may actually be done by separate groups of people. So a risk treatment is basically, well, the mitigation strategy, if you will. So it details how the organization is going to respond to a particular risk. Now, this is going to get a little bit tricky because now we have to start to look at how much does it cost to mitigate a risk versus was it really worth it? In other words, sometimes the salaries involved in somebody implementing a mitigation control, along with the cost of the mitigation control may way exceed the fact that the uh, of what the vulnerability might actually be. So we need to start to weigh those decisions here. And then when we do implement a certain risk mitigation strategy, start to monitor its effectiveness. This is a good time actually to explain why it's called a risk treatment rather than risk reduction or risk mitigation overall as a, a, a as a name for this. And the reason is that we have actually four ways of dealing with a risk and not all of them. Well, you're going to be kind of surprised by what some of these are. First of all, there's the one that I've been using mainly in our discussions, which is risk reduction. So we want to, uh, through the implementation of a series of controls, and with an incident response plan, we want to reduce or mitigate um, uh, the, the, an exploiter vulnerability that could occur. And we're not going to be able to remove it hundred percent, but at least we could mitigate the impact to the business. In other words, reducing loss. Well, this isn't the only thing that we can do with a risk. We can avoid the risk. I, <laughs> I, it sounds kind of strange, but we could, we could do risk avoidance, which is, removing the risk by not implementing whatever it is that could cause the risk. Now, in some ways, this may sound kind of ridiculous. How can you, you know, if you need to have a network switch, and there is a risk that that network switch fails, how can you do risk avoidance? Well, one way of risk avoidance is through purchasing a known quality switch that has the most minimum amount of vulnerabilities and has the greatest you know number of uptime hours in other words you can do this as a purchase decision um, and avoid a lot of the risk that you could be getting into but again this will and can affect cost 
Another way of avoidance is the classical avoidance. Um, I ride a motorcycle and the risk of death is much higher on when I ride my motorcycle than when I drive my car. Now there's a risk of death either way, but it's much higher on the motorcycle. Well, if I don't ride a motorcycle, I can avoid all of those individual events that could cause death. Um, so that's avoidance. And when a company makes a decision on dealing with risk, it might choose to reduce it, it also might choose to avoid it. And sometimes, sometimes you just you just have to accept it. <laughs> this is where the cost of mitigating a risk um, doesn't really make sense. And you can't avoid the risk. And it probably won't occur very often. In other words, you can predictably say, it's not going to occur very often. Well, then you the company may make a decision just to accept the risk and move on. Let me give you a decision uh, or a uh, situation that I was in. There was a, uh, a very important security bulletin that had come out. And this was several years ago. And this this actually turned out to be a bigger deal than than we initially thought. And this particular security update that came out had a very high risk of of crashing the servers that it was being installed on. And which meant, obviously, you to mitigate that, you know, you would you would do the best that you could, but there was, you know, a high events of, of, of server outages, which meant that you had incident response of having to rebuild the server could cost hours of time to do that. You had to make sure that your backups were good, that you knew how to rebuild the server. There was a lot involved in that risk management process just to deal with that update. And it turns out that the update itself, though, fixed a vulnerability that wasn't really a known or used vulnerability at that time. In fact, the vulnerability was considered, you know, nobody's done anything with it, nobody's exploited it. And to the best of the knowledge, nobody's looking at it. So the company decided and through its risk management process, just to accept that risk of not implementing the security update. Now, as it turned out, that quickly became a problem because six months later, there was an exploit of it. And this became something called Code Red, which also then led to uh, the NIMDA internet worm, which caused major outages. Um, however, just as a, a little side note, uh, back at that time, initially the updates caused a lot of server outages. But within about, oh, I think it was around 60 days, the updates were improved so that they didn't cause the server outages. Now, what that means is, is that if you aren't continually monitoring, see, I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but I am. If you, are, if you are continually monitoring and redoing your risk assessment, then you would have said, look, this is no longer a high risk to cause server outages. We will do our best to reduce it, but we are going to implement this security patch. And if you'd done that, and like a lot of the companies that I was working with at the time, that's exactly what we did, then you avoided the exploit that came later. So there is a point to where companies can use acceptance and make a decision based upon that, but always reevaluate. And also there's another way of dealing with risk. And I, you and I are both really familiar with this. It's transference. Uh, this is, and I like the way, uh, placing the cost of a risk on a third party. Yeah, this is your insurance company. Um, so think about this, you have uh, car insurance. If you get into an accident, rather than you having to pay the cost of the event, you've pushed it off to a third party, your insurance company that will pay for that cost. Sure, there might be a little bit of a deductible in there, but they will take a care of insuring you against, you know, the lawsuits and stuff like that. They'll take care of the cost. Now, this sounds almost like a magical solution. Businesses have this too. They have a variety of different types of insurance that they have done risk transference with. However, just like the insurance company for your car, if you're in an accident, let's say every other month, well, at some point that third party is going to say, wait a minute, this, this isn't working. Um, the way that you're driving is bad. And so we're not going to continue to keep insuring you. So it, when you're using this type of risk transference, like insurance, it has to be done with the responsibility of that this event may never occur, or if it does occur, will occur very rarely. Once you perform the risk assessment, so you've identified the types of risk, how likely they are to happen and, 
and how much loss they could occur to the company. And then you've defined your treatment plans. How are you going to treat those risks? Are you going to reduce them if you're going to avoid them? Now it's time to document um, all this information and your audit findings and then monitor. In other words, keep making sure you're doing revisions for this. Now, the documentation can be broken down in a couple of different ways. And, and this is just some suggestions. This is pretty common uh, documentation to do. A lot of people make adjustments to this for their, their own organization. But then let's talk about two of them in pri you know, right off the bat. We'll talk about the, the risk register. And when you're doing your risk analysis, this is when it's a good time to have uh, an Excel spreadsheet works, um, but a database is, is better. Um, and record that risk information. Now, what kind of risk information do you want to be able to record? Well, you want to be able to give each risk its own number. And you're going to see why, because you want to be able to relate this to other tables in the database. You're going to want to give the uh, name of the risk. This might be uh, something that internally you've created or that the uh, risk or vulnerability itself has actually been given. Um, the date that it got reported as a vulnerability or risk and the last update to this particular row of data. Now, who's going to be responsible for managing this risk? What's its impact rating? In other words, just what we were talking about, uh, is it just a little tiny bit of a risk? In other words, we might do some avoidance with this or acceptance of this. Um, or is it a, does it have a very strong impact that will cause uh, extreme loss to the organization? So you want to rate those. High, medium, low, give it a numbering scheme. You obviously also want to have a description of the risk and the likelihood that it's going to occur. This was that NIST document that I had showed you. This is basically all comprised of step two, and this is how you're documenting that. And then whatever completed actions you've taken on this. Now, let me just say that recording this in an Excel spreadsheet is okay. Um, but think about the amount of data and the time that you're going to have this data. An Excel spreadsheet is, is probably not the best way, especially in medium to large size organizations, and especially the larger your infrastructure is that you are responsible for the information security on. So I highly recommend that you make a database for this. Now, there are some third party databases that already exist that you could look at purchasing, but it's not that difficult to make your own database with your own tables that you can start to create this if one doesn't exist. Now, if you're your organization has already established a risk management platform, then a lot of this may already be out there for you. Um, another report that you're going to want to have around is the treatment schedule. So when we've identified a risk, and through our risk assessment, what are we going to do to treat it and the schedule for it? So again, you're going to want to relate that to the risk identification number so that you can keep the tables of this information tied together along with the name of the risk. What controls were decided on to be used um, for this risk? And those controls being reduction controls um, to, to implement, what were they? And I, also you'll see that I have a cost benefit analysis, the cost of those controls along with its implementation uh, versus uh, the impact rating that this risk has is your cost benefit analysis. Now, what's the rating after you've treated this? In other words, you had an initial impact rating, and let's say it was a high that this caused a great amount of loss. Has it been reduced now? Because was that was it that the right controls? It's n there's nothing worse than spending a lot of money on a control that when you look at it, didn't actually reduce the impact. So you want to take a look at that impact rating again and make sure that the treatment created the benefit that was expected. Again, what team is responsible for these controls that they're putting on and, and taking care of those controls? And what monitoring methods are out there? Now, like I said, in this course, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about some different monitoring methods that are available to you. You want to select a method, make sure you have it recorded. Now, even though you've mitigated this risk, you've selected controls, you've reduced the risk, Let's say that you know it, it, it works for a cost benefit analysis, you're really happy with the rating after treatment, there's still a possibility that this, this can go wrong. And you're going to need to have an incident response. And let me give you the typical 
server example. Uh, the server's running an application that is a mission critical uh, line of business application. And you've put in some controls to mitigate risk from outside hackers uh, coming in and making changes to that application. It might be a website that um, allows customers to order products. And so you've put in controls to stop that from happening. But if it does happen, what is the incident response? Do you have a backup of the application? Do you have a backup of clean data that you're going to be able to put back up on there? How long is this incident response plan going to take? And who is involved? We have an entire course coming up all on incident response. So if you haven't seen that, go ahead and take a look at it. Um, and then go through all the details of how to build an, in, an incident response plan. But here in this document, you want to have it specified. So out of our audit findings, this it pretty much covers our risk assessment and our risk treatment schedule. But you know, one of the things that we're going to need to do here coming up is we need more details on how to conduct some of this risk analysis. And these will come up in the next module as we dive into it on our security assessment activities that we're going to do, including some of those calculations I told you about that would help us establish um, the loss to the company and, and uh, you know, deciding whether a risk is something we do need to mitigate. So, but before we get to that, let's talk about what we've done in this module. I can't 100% ensure that when I walk outside, I'm not going to get rained on. But I can certainly do an awful lot of work to reduce that particular risk and some of the events that could occur because it's raining outside, like slipping as I'm walking and sliding my car into an accident. I can come up with strategies to reduce that. I can do my assessment. I can understand what the possible events are and then what controls I can put in place for those. And then evaluate how well those controls are working. And that's the process that we started to look at in this module. First of all, we took a look at the risk visibility and reporting. And at most companies, they don't have great visibility and reporting of risk. They don't have an enterprise risk management platform in place. And really it's because of their lack of understanding of how to get it in place, what it takes to get it done. And companies that do put this in place, well, then they can save themselves from a lot of loss that can affect the business. So that's when we started to talk about the risk management concepts of what the risk management platform is, what the idea behind doing risk management was. And we defined some of the terminology that we're going to be working with, like assets and threats and vulnerabilities and those controls. And by using that terminology, we started to build out a risk assessment. And we looked at the NIST document that has a, an official risk assessment, but you could see that you could build your own, but it gave a good flow for what a risk assessment is. And that's identifying the risk, identifying how much harm it could cause to the business and how often it might occur. And if that risk occurs, well, how do we treat that? How do we reduce it, mitigate it? Um, we might decide to avoid it. We might um, decide to just accept that particular risk, but decisions need to get made. And that was our treatment plan. From there, we could then take this information and document and document not only the decisions that were made in the process, but then document the actual findings themselves. So documenting the risks that we discover, documenting um, how we wanted to handle or treat those risks, documenting what controls we we're going to use with those risks. That's all an incredibly important part because with that documentation, we can now review that documentation on a timely basis and we can monitor to see if there's been any changes that we need to be aware of. The faster we know about changes, the faster we know about new risks, new vulnerabilities or flaws and controls that we might be using, the sooner we know that, the sooner we can fix that, redocument it and keep moving on and help the business move forward by mitigating as much loss as possible. Well, this has been a, a pretty exciting module, but it gets even more exciting in the next module as we start to look at the uh, security assessment activities, specific things that you can do in assessing your risks. And so, well, coming up next, that's what we're going to do is perform security assessment activities.
Whether you're new to information security as a security professional or you've been doing it for quite some time, your participation in the process of security testing and evaluation, well, that's paramount. That's one of the most important aspects to the job. And it can take different forms depending upon where you are in the organization and how your organization behaves. The idea here is that you have an understanding of the frameworks and the processes to evaluate things like assets, the threats that are out there, the vulnerabilities, um, and the controls that you can use as part of your risk treatment. Now, you might be responsible for doing all of it. In other words, within your particular area, you might be the one that does all, you know, that, that discovers all the assets, inventories the assets, determines what threats are out there um, that could affect those assets, what additional vulnerabilities those assets may have. And you might be the one that needs to evaluate and test a variety of controls that can um, reduce or, uh, you know, mitigate those vulnerabilities. Or you might be responsible for just one piece of this. You just might be responsible for a while at testing controls. So this is a many faceted kind of thing. And what, what I want to do is make sure you have the frameworks behind you to back it up and then give you some real risk analysis scenarios that we can work with here. Now, to make sure that you have the frameworks, first of all, um, we have to bring in some some of the standards organizations that create these frameworks. And so the International Organization of Standards, the International Electrotechnical Commission, um, ISO, the 27,000 uh, series is a series of documents. And a matter of fact, you can go out to your favorite search engine if you want to and, and bring this series of documents up. There's quite a few of them. And this, the idea is that they are going to provide some of the best practices on things like security management, risk management, um, selection of controls for, and they'll label this as the Information Security Management System, ISMS. This is your system that you have in place for all of your management. Now, before you just go running out there to read all of them, there's quite a few of them <laughs> that are out there. Let me kind of dial you in on uh, some that are particularly useful for us right now. So the ISO 27002 uh, particular documents, that's a code of practices and guidelines for IT security management and in, in general. I think what you'll find really useful to take a gander at is ISO 27005. This is the one that's focused on risk management. And it covers things that we've already talked about. So this is going to look really familiar to you. It's going to talk about risk assessments, risk treatment, things like, you know, risk acceptance. Um, communication, who do you communicate to and monitoring of your assessments. So this is information, a great place to kind of go in for more detailed information on the things that we've already talked about. But these ISO documents, they're good. They, don't get me wrong, they are very good. I oftentimes go towards the NIST documents. As a matter of fact, this one in particular, NIST SP 800-37 Rev 1, we're going to spend quite a bit of time with here right at the very beginning. This is a more practical approach to risk management. And, and, and let me just tell you the reason why is that the ISO documents are, are great, but they're very general. In other words, they cover a wide variety of organizations. Well, the federal government, the United States federal government, um, needed some more practical approaches for itself. And that's what the NIST documents provide. And these practical approaches oftentimes give you better information when you're looking at your own risk management process. And so having the uh, NIST approach is a little bit more detailed. And so that's really the document I'm going to encourage you to take a look at. And there's a couple of things in particular that we want to spend some time with. First of all, Take a look at the tiered risk management approach. Now, don't panic. I bet you're going to find that you're already more familiar with this than you might think. Remember, we were talking about the enterprise management that you wanted to try to bring into an organization or an organization should try to adopt. Here's the documentation, more detailed documentation on that. So SP 800-37 Rev 1 provides this information. And by the way, at there at the very bottom of the screen is a link to the document, or you just go to your favorite search engine and go ahead and type it in. What they've done is they've broken this down into three tiers um, in the NIST document for their approach 
to how the organization can bring in the uh, risk management. And this is going to seem very familiar. Let me break these three tiers out for you, starting with um, tier number one. So tier number one is the actual organizational level. This is where the governance is created. So what kind of things do we need here? These are going to be where we decide on the techniques and methodologies that the organization is going to employ. So this is deciding on what frameworks we're going to use and also on the methods that we're going to um, use to evaluate um, identified risks. And that's one of the things that we're going to dive more into in this module. Now, what kind of mitigation measures are we going to take? And we talked about this with treatments. There's different types of mitigation we can do. It could be reduction, could be acceptance, it could be avoidance. And as far as the organization goes, the organization needs to make decisions on what ones are we going to use and under what criteria. So if we're going to, if we're going to accept a risk, we first need to make sure that the organization um, you know, we'll only accept risks that are, you know, have, you know, a very low percentage of being able to, of, of occurring. So we also then want to look at that, that level of risk acceptance. And that's how we're kind of tying these two together. Also monitoring practices. How are we going to make sure that the decisions that we're making at the organizational level are being fulfilled, that they're being executed the way we anticipated? And that then turns to the degree of oversight through this monitoring to make sure the decisions that we made are being executed. Who's in charge of this process? Who needs to make sure that this is occurring the way that we wanted to? Now, at the organizational level, that's where these decisions of both the policies and the procedures and the methodologies that we're going to use are made. Tier two is where we need to make some statements on the business process or the business mission that's involved. So we need to define what the core mission is. We don't know what to protect for the business if we don't understand what the business process is. In other words, I could have an application that I spend a tremendous amount of time of discovering its vulnerabilities and figuring out what its mitigation strategies are going to be, but it's an application that isn't used or that isn't part of the business of the mission of the business itself. So we need to define those things so we are focused on the right things at the right time. And then define the information that the organization needs to maintain. And I'm just going to bring back in the whole concept of the CIA triad. And so we're thinking about the data that uh, the organization needs. What's confidential? What do we need to make sure that um, it, we're maintaining integrity on, that we have availability for? Some information that the organization has isn't actually necessary to the business process or to achieving the mission goals for the business. That information, we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it until we've gotten the important stuff taken care of. So you can see that these definitions are, are very important. That's how we develop our protection strategy. Now we know where to focus um, our strength, where we, you know, we're going to focus all of our time and efforts in order to be able to clean this up. And then it comes to tier three, and this is where a lot of us like to operate. And this is where we will then go in, you know, identify the risks and look at the mitigation procedures and make the selection of the controls and safeguards that we're going to put in place. And this also will involve the monitoring process that will tie back into um, the oversight that is going on for all three tiers. Now, as we talked about with the enterprise management uh, concept uh, for risk management, this is a much more detailed definition of that. So if you dive into the document, you can see it. Now, right after this, inside of SP 800-37, they start to talk about the risk management framework. And this is the steps to go through for your risk management process. And I remember as a young IT professional, the first time I went through this, and it seemed like it was a lot, but I think you'll see that from all of the work that we've done so far in this course, it starts to make sense as a reiterative process now for our risk management. And so it starts with uh, going through a six step process. And I'm going to break these down a little bit, but step one is categorize. Then we go to select, implement, assess, authorize, and monitor. So let's, let's break this down um, that this, oh, and there's the location of the document. We'll break this down a little bit more. So first of all, to categorize. So we're going to collect information on our systems and our threats. As we've said, we need to know what assets are out there 
and what kind of threats will affect those assets and what kind of vulnerabilities are out there. Once we do that, we can then select, or in this case, identify the controls that we're gonna use to mitigate those vulnerabilities and to prevent those threats as best we can from occurring. Now, this is where we're gonna start to need to tailor this for our you know, specific types of business and what we're um, trying to protect. This is part of, and this is why it ties into that first part where the organization has to make some decisions about what are, is it that we're gonna protect and what are the mission critical things and we have to understand about the business more so that we know that we are selecting the proper controls for the proper you know, threats that we're trying to uh, save the uh, organization from. Then step three is once we've selected those controls, we need to look at the implementation of them. And this is the implementation process. Some controls, like a firewall, requires that it be installed, configured, tested. Some controls may not be the installation of hardware, they may be the installation of software, or it may be a procedural control. If this event occurs, then do this is the control that we're going to do. It may be a, a written process that we're gonna implement. So it's the implementation phase. And this will um, have all of the decisions that we've also made about alternatives, the cost to this, and the risk of trade-offs. If we decided to use a cheaper control versus a more expensive one, what trade-offs are we looking at? Or if we decided that we uh, decided to um, do risk acceptance, what is the trade-off that we're looking at? Step four is gonna be then to assess, and that is, did the control or our implementation, let's put it that way, did it perform as expected? Is it working the way that we thought that it would work. And this includes making sure that we're still in line with the cost that we thought we would spend for it. Um, you know, did the implementation process work as expected? And is the control performing correctly? Now, once we do that, then we need to report information to the authorizing officials. And this simply is part of that communication stage where we make sure that the people that are supposed to be um, responsible for making sure that the organization is following its risk management, that, that we're giving that information to them to show that it is occurring. And it also gives us an opportunity to make sure that we have great documentation on the first four steps and then step six is monitor. And this is gonna be where we're monitoring, again, the effectiveness of the controls. Really, we're looking for if there's any changes to the system, because as soon as there's a change made to the system, and remember the last course, we talked about change management. If there's a change to the system, that suddenly means we may have opened up other vulnerabilities, that we've added additional risk that we might need to make sure that we're still compensating, that we have controls for those. And also, you know, we might be monitoring for particular federal uh, guidelines that we need to, to, to follow as well. Now, one thing to um, I wanna remind you about is that it's not that we do these six steps and then stop. No, it's that we do these six steps and we go right back to the first step. You know, that's part of, you know, monitoring the effectiveness and changes to the system right there. Changes to the system sends us right back to step one. If any change occurs, let's categorize, find out what threats are available. Then we go back to selecting it, implementing, assessing, authorizing, and monitoring again. So this is an important framework to follow through. Now, each company can implement their own. However, it's great to have this documentation. And it's good for you to go through and actually kind of read through this documentation because it's a great place to start. I remember I myself, uh, the first time I had to do this, with a company, this is where we started. Um, and then we built our processes then around this. And so it's very helpful to give you guidance and guidelines for it. But you know what, I think we should kind of take this and do our own risk analysis and start to drill into some of the calculations that we can do and tie this all together. So we have the frameworks now, now let's start to do the actual, well, the actual testing and work for all of this. Throughout the conversations of risk assessment and risk treatment, and as we've been looking at the frameworks, like the risk management framework, to give you step-by-step -step guidance of how to perform risk management, we keep talking about identifying 
you know, your assets and the risk to those assets. And then, you know, you'll start to select, con you know, controls to help deal with those vulnerabilities. We often mention cost. Well, now it's time to kind of look at how we get to cost with risk analysis. Now, risk analysis is still identifying those potential threats, um, but it's focused on determining the asset value and the cost of the controls so that we can determine whether we want to invest in a certain level of control or we don't want to invest. And so there's some calculations involved in this. Really, there's two kind of terms we want to look at. It's a quantitative analysis versus a qualitative analysis. And in an earlier course, I had mentioned these, but here's where we're going to drill down deeper on these and do some calculations. So first of all, quantitative. This is where we're going to determine the cost if an asset is lost, as in 100% lost. Well, maybe not 100%. And that's part of the issue here. I want you to think about this. You know, there is times when you could lose an entire device, the device completely fails, there's going to be a cost to replacing that device, there's going to be a cost due to the outage until we get it replaced. Well, but some things don't fail 100%. And that's what we need to take in account for. And we try to figure that out. So cost of replacement um, the, the actual asset itself, if it's, you know, a piece of hardware, that kind of makes sense. I bought a server, it cost me 10 grand. If I come if that server has a meltdown, I mean, completely melts down, I'm going to have to spend another 10 grand. But also in that cost of replacement, we want to think about like salaries that are involved, the people that are doing the replacement, well, they have time and cost associated with them as well. There, if it's an application, maybe there's some additional development that has to be done. Maybe when the asset was lost, it also caused other assets to fail. That would be a liability cost. Now you might be saying, well, how am I supposed to determine all of this? And, and, and that's one of the challenges to doing this. This is the investigative or analysis side to this is if I, if, you know, switch a crashes, does it take anything else with it? And we, how much did switch a cost us and how much time is it going to take to replace it? How much does, you know, if Bob is going to replace it, what do I pay Bob per hour to do that? So you have to add the numbers up to get your cost. Now, a couple of, a little bit of the terminology that we're looking at is single loss expectancy, SLE. And by the way, you want to know this for the exam. This is the one-time cost of the loss. And how we calculate that, and it looks a little strange, is first of all, we needed the asset value in dollars. So AV will be the asset value in dollars. And then EF is the exposure factor as a percentage. Here's what we mean by exposure factor. Is it going to be a 100% loss? Is it we looking at a 50% loss? And, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples to kind of clarify that. Well, the equation is pretty straightforward. The single loss expectancy is the asset value in dollars um, times its exposure factor. So let's take a look at an example. I've already started using this of a network switch. So let's say that the switch um, and the time that it takes the cost of the switch and the time that it takes to replace the switch. Notice how I've added salary into this. Let's say it costs us 20 grand. And if the switch fails, it's a 100% failure. I mean, we lose that portion of the network. Well, then we'll take 20,000 times one and 100% failure. That gives us our single loss expectancy, which is going to be 20 grand. But let's take a different approach. Let's say I have a database server that's providing data through databases um, and, and through applications out to the employees. On that database server, let's say we have a failure of a database, and that's about a 50% failure. I've got two databases out there. It's 50%. It causes a 50% disruption. Let's say that to bring that database back up, I've determined that somebody has to sit there and restore it, the time that it takes to restore it, the business value that's lost during that time to restore it. The database server itself has experienced a 50% loss. So $10,000 is the cost that I have for it, the asset value, and times 0.5, which means, well, I'm not going to have a $10,000 loss if, if I get an event. It's going to be a $5,000 loss. Now, you might be saying, well, 
okay, so I've determined how much I'm going to lose. You know, if I have a, a, a an event and I, I've determined what I'm going to lose in, in that single event, but I actually need to forecast this like over a year. Well, we can do that. With this information, we can now forecast our annualized loss expectancy, ALE. And this is what we're predicting to lose in a year. Now, I'll just tell you right now, you can start with a year. Some companies like to do two years, three years. That way they can try to uh, amortize the cost of some of the controls that they're putting in place and have a better understanding of the impact. But let's start with a year. So how we calculate this is we need the annualized rate of occurrence. That's a big word for how many times is it going to crash? Uh, <laughs> so between uh, how many times is it going to crash, the equation then becomes our annualized loss expectancy for a year is the SLE, our single loss expectancy, times how many times we think it's going to crash over a year. Now, kind of consider this for a moment. We've talked a lot about this throughout this course so far. So if you have threats to your assets and you're one of the threats is a hurricane, that's the agent that's going to, and some of the uh, vectors for it are going to be high winds and you're going to have, uh, you know, high, you know, excessive rain, which can cause events like power outages and flooding, which will also then cause systems to go down and systems need to be replaced. Well, how many times does your area have a hurricane? Well, if, if you know, I live in Arizona, we don't have hurricanes. I don't need to worry about hurricanes. Now I do need to worry about big storms and power outages, and I need to worry about flooding. But how often do I do we hear experience in that? Well, an interesting side note is we have a monsoon season. It's a basically between you know, it's basically July and August. And during that monsoon season, we can have very short term, but very extreme storms with winds that get really close to hurricane speed and with torrential downpours that uh, just huge amounts of water come out of the sky. So for those two months, I can look at the farmer's almanac or I could look at past performance and say, uh, I think uh, we, we run the risk of having a, a power outage due to a uh, monsoon storm. Uh, probably five, six times a year. Now, the year might be isolated to July and August, but that helps me then solve this equation. So as another example, so let's say that we're worried about a network outage and a temporary network outage due to power costs us, let's say $10,000. That's because um, the network has gone out, we've lost business, um, we've had to bring some systems back online that may not have been protected by by a generator or batteries. And so let's say that we determine, and I'm using really simple numbers here, that we've determined it's 10 grand every time we have a network outage. And we expect, because we expect to lose power to this portion of the network, we expect that to occur four times a year. We can quickly see that our ALE for the year on this particular um, event um, and asset is going to be 40 grand. Now, here's the question. Now that I've determined that I'm going to have a network outage on some of this network gear because it's not protected and it's going to cost me $40,000 a year. That's what I'm predicting. Well, how much does it cost to put in uh, some backup batteries? How much does it cost now to maybe put in another generator so that we can cover or mitigate the commercial loss of power. See how this is starting to work now? With this kind of factual data that we're putting together, we can now start to make decisions and decisions that we can back up with dollars and cents. Now, a, a, a generator, it's gonna cost more than 40 grand. Uh, <laughs> probably, uh, you know, those big outdoor business generators kind of thing, but maybe backup batteries that can keep that network up for a couple of minutes. Uh, maybe 20 minutes, maybe that would help reduce the loss to the organization. And so these are the things that we start to factor in. As a side note, also, uh, you do want to keep these equations in mind for when you take the exam. But more importantly, for real life, understand that it's more than just, you know, when we say cost of replacement, remember, there's salaries involved, um, and time that it takes, and the business might be losing money uh, due to lack of sales or, or, or customer dissatisfaction that also needs to be factored in. Now, this is the quantitative 
loss uh, or the quantitative uh, analysis that we want to do, we do have another one. And that part of our risk analysis uh, analysis is the qualitative one. Or the, the, I, did I say qualitative before? That was quantitative that we just did. This is qualitative. And qualitative is is harder to determine the dollars that, that apply to this because it's very subjective. And so as a strategy, we want to do the quantitative as best we can. And those are the hard facts that we can come up with. And then we need to be uh, sensitive to the qualitative side. And the qualitative side can involve things, um, because there's no dollars, it often is going to be ranked um, as far as an analysis as, you know, how likely is it to impact and the level of its impact will be ranked by words like high, medium, or low, or it could be done like numbers, like on a scale one to five, five being the highest amount of impact what would this particular event subjectively do? And it would rank maybe a three. Well, the reason this is hard to determine is because we need to ask people about their experiences. Yeah, we need to ask subject matter experts and we need to conduct interviews to find out if this event occurs, what has happened in the past? What has happened to other companies? And you're probably saying to yourself at this point, what events are you talking about that, that would be so elusive to be able to come up with? And what it really is, is any event that could cause damage to things that are more intangible to grab hold of. Um, customers. Let's say an event occurs where it causes customers to have ill will um, towards the business. And they, those customers start to leave. What event could that be? Well, depending upon your business, it could be a variety of different things. But let's just say that someone, you know, hacked into the network or somebody internal released, you know, customer confidential information and made it public. This creates um, issues. And now here's the thing. It's hard to sometimes monetize how much revenue did we lose because customers were leaving or customers, we, we damage the goodwill with customers. Now, also events can occur where we have loss of employee productivity and not all of it is measurable. I, I remember I was uh, helping a business with a, a very large commerce site and we had very clear statistics that if the commerce site could not take orders, that they would lose X amount of dollars per hour. And I, I don't remember actually what the dollar amount was. I just remember at the time, it seemed like a lot of money. But we had good solid facts on these are the orders that don't get placed and they don't get placed in the future. In other words, customers went to somewhere else. Well, okay, that's a good set of hard numbers, but it doesn't show the loss to employee productivity. If those orders aren't being placed, that means, well, the orders aren't going to the warehouse. The warehouse isn't picking the products, isn't shipping the products, which means I've got warehousing people that are sitting around waiting for the ordering system to come back online. And I've got salaries tied to that. Now you might be saying, well, we can figure that out. In a lot of cases, we do figure it out. But think about what I had mentioned. A lot of customers aren't going to come back. They're going to order it from somewhere else. So that gets really hard to start to determine as part of the qualitative analysis. And I just have to say that for good reasons and for bad reasons, bad publicity is very uh, hard to determine what the effect on some businesses is going to be. But as I noted uh, with you at the towards the very beginning, Bad publicity is, is, is something that is also motivating a lot of companies to get better at their risk management processes and to do better at their analysis on all of this. Now, that's the good that comes out of it. The bad that comes out of it is that, quite honestly, people are being affected by this. It's affecting their lives, their careers. You know, everybody's got a mortgage to pay. Bad publicity really it just creates even more problems for the company. And it's hard to track sometimes what that loss is, but if it appears on CNN, it's not gonna be a good day. So in order to understand whether you're being effective with these management processes or not, is we have to document everything 
and then monitor everything. So let's kind of go through um, the ideas that we've put together so far in a rather orderly fashion. First of all, we need to perform our risk assessment. And that means that we're going to need to determine what assets we have, what events might happen to those assets, the vulnerabilities those assets may have, and then looking at the mitigations or the uh, treatments that we want to do for those assets. So we'll determine those potential threats and then calculate out our single loss expectancy. So when I lose an asset, what does that mean to the business? Now, it's important that we take some time to do this and we try to do it as accurately as possible because that's really what's gonna come back as we start to scan and monitor for all of this. Now, we'll determine how often an outage can occur, and that was our annualized rate of occurrence, so we can determine that you know over a year what our loss expectancy is. And this can help us make decisions financially on the kind of controls that we want to put in place. So we'll perform our risk treatment, whatever we decide to do with a particular risk, is you know reduction, avoidance, acceptance, transfer it. And here's where the important part is. We need to document this. And now we talked about like risk, the risk register and the treatment schedule, but there's other documentation as well that you may include with this, including the management process itself. You know, we looked at the risk management framework. You may have documentation at each and every step of that. Now with that documentation, now we need to communicate and monitor. And here's where the interpretation of our reporting of basically all the work that we've been doing will start to occur. Now we're gonna talk about ways to monitor, but monitoring itself means that we're gonna now review for changes and we're also going to see if there's something that we missed. If we did lose a system that we've tried to uh, protect, why did we lose it? Is there another set of controls? And we need to be able to look at that loss and then do the analysis on the loss. How much did it cost to replace it? Did it fail 100% or did it only fail 50%? So as we're looking at the information that we're getting back from whatever tools that we're using, you know, if it's an application that has an outage, if it was an order entry application, do we know how many orders we would usually get in that time frame so that we can measure that loss? And that's what we wanna then put back into this process and make sure that we've adjusted for that real life data and occurrence. Well, you know, we've done a lot in this module. Let's take a look at what we've done and where we're going. I think you've seen in this module, there's a lot to be done for risk management. But there was something though, I, I, I want you to kind of keep in mind is that as in a career for uh, information security, for the security professional, you might be a part of pieces of this at first. And as your experience and talents grow, then you'll be added to more and more of this as it goes through. But it helps to have a, a good, strong understanding of what are the frameworks that this comes from? And, you know, if I want to look at more information, you know, I, I can. And what kind of processes am I going to go through? And that's what we were really doing in participating in security testing and evaluation. We wanted to spend some time on not only identifying the frameworks, but how they worked, how the business brings in the risk management process, and how you do things like risk analysis. We broke down to the calculations of looking at how do I determine what it costs to lose something? And what am I gonna use that data for? I'm gonna use it to decide on what kind of controls to mitigate that risk I wanna be able to use. Can we afford those controls or can we afford not to purchase those controls? And with doing this process, you get more and more comfortable with interpreting and reporting those results that you're getting back and closing up the gaps in the analysis. Now, one of the most important parts to all of this, especially in the interpretation and reporting, because we've got more to do on that, is in the monitoring. And throughout this course so far, I've been saying, I'm trying not to talk too much about monitoring, but now is the time when we can start to talk about monitoring and some of the ways you can monitor these processes on your network. It's a big part to our risk management, our assessment, our evaluations that we're doing. So coming up next, we're gonna to start to operate and maintain monitoring systems.
I might think that at times I'm superhuman, but <laughs> it just doesn't work out that way. You know, let me give you an example. I can't sit there and watch the screen of a server and what it's doing and the actions that it's performing. I can't do that day and night. I need the application itself to help me out here and log things that are occurring to it. Even if I was watching the screen, I may not be able to see everything. And I need this to be logged over time. So our devices, our network devices, our applications, our servers, they all make logs. And the reason for this is that we want to be able to use this log information to do analysis. If an event occurs, well, I want to know what caused the event. And by going to these logs, we can start to identify things like, when did the event start to occur? What actions were taken against the devices? Um, what did the devices do? When did they stop responding? This kind of information is part of the analysis that we can do for those logs. So uh, there's types of the logs that are out there. And you probably already have experience with this, even on your own laptop or computer. You know, uh, you've got event logs that tell you about events, informational events and errors and warnings. You have performance logs that can track how things are performing. Is there a process that's taking up too much of your processor's time? We have audit logs and change logs that are out there. There's different types of logs. But the challenge to this is gathering this log information. And so there's a couple of ways we can do this. Log collection could be done through passive monitoring. And my the example that I like to use for this, it, it, well, first of all, hardware and software can collect all of their logging data. And I like to use it as passive monitoring example of using a network analyzer. A network analyzer will allow me to collect the packets of communication off of a network that I then can go through and start to analyze. Maybe I think that there's someone possibly trying to penetrate a particular system. Or maybe it's not nefarious. Maybe I think there's a performance issue between a SQL server responding to a request and the website that's making the request. And I want to see how long it takes for the response to occur. Using a network analyzer, this often means you plug it into a switch and you plug it into its monitor port or a port that's been set up for mirroring where the packets get dumped to it. And so this analyzer will then collect all of this data and it can be quite a lot of data. This is a passive collection way. In other words, you're just getting the information that's already there. A lot of systems collect the data that's just already being generated so that you can analyze it. Now, that's a little bit different than active monitoring, and sometimes this becomes a little bit of a gray area. But I'm going to go back to the, the kind of a, a network uh, kind of issue. This is where you're actively testing for an event. I don't mean monitoring, but I mean you're putting data out there. And so an example that I actually use all the time in real life is I need to be able to stress test commerce sites or, or any particular website. So we will use a variety of ways of generating network traffic and um, um, uh, web requests to the website, which will then spawn requests in, you know, to the back end database. We can passively monitor that, but the generating of that stress test of those requests, that's an active monitoring kind of situation. We can do it with network analyzers too. There are times when you can use a network analyzer to generate a particular kind of traffic to see how some device responds to that traffic. So with these methods of passive and active monitoring, one of the real goals is to do the collection as best we can in real time. Now that doesn't mean that you're sitting there watching. It means the system is gathering the log in as close to real time as possible. One of the, the benefits to real time collection is that let's say an event occurs that causes an outage. So if I have a Windows server that's running just fine and suddenly it crashes, one of the first things I'm going to want to do is check its event log to see what was the last event that got recorded or the last series of events. It might show me, because it was trying to do it as best, as close as it could to real time, it may show me that there was a particular hardware failure, a device failure that was occurring that caused a device driver to fail that then corrupted the system. And I can now use that data to go, hey, let's take a look at this device driver. Does it need to be updated? Was it an actual hardware failure? Does the hardware need to be replaced? It's guiding me on the approach on fixing it.
So a real time collection are products that are going to automatically and continuously monitor application servers and devices. And they're going to allow me then to do better troubleshooting against that data. Now, along with log collection, you can imagine that there's going to be a tremendous amount of data that gets collected. You can also uh, imagine that there's a lot of, well, confidential information in that data. So log management needs to be part of the process. In fact, well, let me give you a couple of examples. Where are you going to store these logs long term? And how long do you need to store these logs for? Um, some change logs you may need to store on a more permanent basis. Performance logs, maybe you're doing a performance baseline and you've decided those need to be stored for a year to be able to do an analysis against. Event logs, well, you know, if the server's running fine, you may not need to store that for, you know, a year. You may only need to store it for perhaps you've decided a month. So you need to decide how long and where you're going to store this, this particular data. It's going to be a lot of data, so you need to have the storage requirements for it. Are you going to back this data up? In other words, if these logs are so important that you need to store them like performance logs for a year, you probably need to back it up. And when this data is no longer needed, how do you dispose it? How are you reminded that you need to dispose of it? Since a lot of this log information contains confidential information, disposal might be a little bit more challenging. In other words, it's not just, you know, just uh, delete it. It might be we need to securely delete that log data um, from the system. So log management is a part of this process. I, and I have to say one of the, the challenges that um, a lot of IT admins face is they don't do any real log management. So they either get logs that are of excessive size, taking up huge amounts of data, even to the point when this has happened several times, where collecting log data has actually filled up the disk space on a server and shut it down. Um, so, you know, you've got to be kind of, you know, um, proactive in this log management um, space. Now with managing the logs, collecting the data from the different types of logs, and, and really this matters what devices you're responsible on managing, you have to look at what kind of log data they're pr producing. You may find it easier, and a lot of us, especially in larger systems, find it easier to try to centralize this log data. It helps with log management, and it also helps with the analysis. So let's look at that source, you know, getting it to a centralized source. So here's the following scenario. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Suddenly your phone goes off. There's been a major outage that's having a major impact on the organization. Oh boy, now what? I don't know about you, but this has happened to me a lot. And it, it's, it's just the nature of the beast that it seems that when a major outage occurs, it has to be the middle of the night. I don't know why, but it just seems that's the case. So Here's what a lot of IT folks are going to do. They're going to dash into the office, or maybe if they can, they'll remotely connect to the office. And they're going to want to start to do an analysis. What's wrong? What went wrong? How do we get things back up and running? And by using log data, they're going to start to put the pieces together of what's broken. And so they can therefore fix it. But I want you to think about this. An outage may be across many devices many servers, many applications, and those each one of those may have its own set of logs. That means that to figure out at two o'clock in the morning, what went wrong with the network switches, the firewalls, the applications, the servers, in other words, the logs are scattered and finding and getting access to all those logs and then accumulating that data so that you can analyze what started to fail first can be a real challenge. This is where your source systems can come into play. And really what we're talking about here is oftentimes you'll see this title, Security Information and Event Management. This is how we're managing events and gathering the information. And what we want to do is uh, apply a combination of software and hardware products that can monitor um, the events that are occurring and which most of the, the hardware and software that you have does monitor it. But we want to see if we can try to centralize, uh, centrally locate this information on a source system that we can then use for analysis. A couple of benefits to this is if it's aggregated to a central source for analysis, 
A, the analysis is easier. I have one place to go and I can say at two o'clock in the morning, uh, show me, you know, these particular assets. What were they doing at that time? What were their logs showing at that time? Also think about this from log management. Um, log management becomes a lot easier if it's aggregated to a centralized location. You've got a centralized way to back it up and you have a centralized location to both monitor the uh, size on disk and when you're cleaning stuff up. So there's a lot of benefits to it, but really the main benefit is to you getting a clearer picture during the analysis phase of what's going on when an event occurs. So that analysis, that's the number one key. Now, the other thing is this, is that we want to try to avoid getting in too much data. And this is a hard call to make. A lot of the products that you can work with are configurable. And I'm gonna give you some, uh, some detailed examples here in a minute, but they're configurable for specific events or triggers that you can set up. In other words, you can say, hey, look, you know, if it, you're just reporting that everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, I really don't need that in my log data right now. What I need is when everything's not fine. So report that instead. Not only does that reduce the size of the log data that's being accumulated, but it focuses more down and makes it easier during the analysis to weed through all of that data. And I just want to give you a, a, an example is, is logging to a centralized location. It's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, uh, heterogeneous environments where you have different platforms. And let me just use an example of a Windows server and a Linux box, sometimes getting that data to a centralized location that is easy for you to analyze is just a little bit more challenging because they're different platforms. But as an example of a product that if you were in a Windows environment and you were running some of the Windows Enterprise software like Exchange for email or SQL um, for your databases or IIS for your web servers, a product like System Center Operations Manager is designed to monitor the servers, all of those products, those applications running, and to have a lot of pre-created triggers that they're checking for automatically. And System Center Operations Manager pulls all of that data back to a centralized database, and it can perform a lot of the analysis for you. In other words, it has all of the I want to say all the brain power, but it has basically the brain power that everybody's written up in its algorithms to do a lot of the analysis for you. This is the kind of security information and event management environment that not only helps us from a security platform, but also helps us from the overall um, uh, event management for all systems. And it's, a, it's an IT kind of operation as well. Well, with the source systems, um, how, how can I gather some of this log data? So I want to give you some specific things that can help you gather this log data in your environment that you can start to work with. So how do you get just the logging data on just the stuff you want? Well, those events of interest, can be configured with many of the products that will create that logging data for you. Part of the challenge to this is though, logging methods in the analysis for them will differ depending upon, well, the different targets that you have. So if you're responsible for monitoring uh, Cisco switches, how it does its logging is going to be different than if you're responsible for monitoring Windows servers. So you have to look at what it is that you're going to monitor and what you're going to gather logs from. Then you can look at what features they give you in order to control those for the events that interest you the most. Now, there are some things that you just need to know that are available to you. And I want to give you, you know, an example of network intrusion. Most security professionals um, spend most of their time looking at network data. You know, the firewalls, are they configured? What kind of attacks are hitting the firewalls? The reason that a lot of security folks spend so much time gathering data on the network is that's usually where the attack begins. So if somebody is going to deface a website, that means they had to get through my firewalls to get to my web server and then go through the web server unauthorized to do that. And so we're looking at that network as the gateway 
where everything starts. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this. Um, most intrusion events begin on the network. So there's a protocol of that can accumulate data for us. You'll, you'll hear this very often. You may already have simple network management protocol, SNMP. And what this does is devices and applications can have something called an SNMP agent that use this protocol. And they can be configured to report data. And these this SNMP traffic that crosses your network is the log data that can be collected. So you can configure to collect things like performance data, you know, outage data, usage data, how much is it being used? How is it being used? Like specifically, like on a firewall, what ports are being used on that firewall? And then this um, can be then collected by a manager. Now, there's something that a term that you're going to hear is MIB, the Management Information Database. This is with SNMP. These are the types of events that we can collect. And it matters. Different devices can collect different amounts of information. This is one of the most common logging protocols that are out there. And most of the, especially on the network, your devices and applications will support it. Once this information can be gathered by a centralized manager, you can now perform an analysis on that data. And the benefit to this is you can have multiple devices you know, that you're collecting this data for so that when an event occurs, you can say, well, at two o'clock, an event happened, what devices started to go out first? And you could start to see what occurred to those devices. So SNMP is an important part to collecting our events of interest. Also, a much more advanced way of doing this, and if you haven't had experience with this, I hope you get a chance to, is the network intrusion detection systems, NIDs that are out there. Intrusion detection systems are uh, systems, and they can be very complicated and expensive to implement, but they will inspect all network traffic. That's really what the goal is, and they can identify suspicious patterns. In other words, they've been programmed to be able to detect and understand. Think about this, you have uh, maybe an antivirus scanner on your computer. It has a list of signatures, of virus signatures, that when it looks at a file, it can see if that signature exists. This is the same way. And this can um, have automated uh, controls for your protection that if certain events take place, it can then do things for you that will automatically protect you. As an example, maybe a particular type of communication is coming from a certain source point um, and it seems to be bad communication, it could block that IP address so that they can't come in. It can help you get the work done. Now, in a lot of cases, these will be signature based like an antivirus uh, uh, scanner. It can also be behavior based due to what the traffic is doing might be an indication of an issue. Now, one of the things about NIDs is you got to be kind of careful with them. They need a lot of active management because when we start letting computers think for themselves, sometimes they can make mistakes and they can block traffic. I'm going to give you a great, an example. Um, there, I was uh, working with a customer with a particular intrusion detection system that after an update, it felt that um, SMTP traffic, simple mail uh, transfer protocol, um, so basically mail messages that were going, uh, that were, that were coming in was coming from a, a, an address that, um, was basically a hack address. So it terminated automatically that email coming in. Well, that happened to be, well, that happened to be our provider. <laughs> so it terminated mail coming in. Now I see this as a messaging engineer, you know, I get a phone call, Hey, we're not getting any email. So of course, you know, my thought process is check the exchange servers and sure enough, we're not getting any email. It took a while to determine that an update on the intrusion detection system caused this issue. Remember what we had talked about in a previous course about change management? <laughs> you know, you don't just make changes when you want to make changes. There's a management process. And this was an indication to failures on several levels. So while intrusion detection systems are very good, they need to be actively managed and well managed. So it's an expensive proposition, but it's an also an excellent proposition in many cases to both um, avoid things coming into your network that shouldn't be there and taking control when you know something tries to get in. Now, along with the events of interest, 
you want to be able to do something like active threat investigation. You want to be able to do research, detection, and deflection. Well, what this means is, is we have some other ways that you can start to capture some information that I want you to be aware of. One of them is honeypots. I don't know if you've heard of this term or not, but honeypots are systems that are designed to be attacked by hackers. In other words, you put a honeypot out in your production network that a hacker is going to attack and you place a lot of controls, monitoring controls on that system so that when a hacker attacks it, you can understand the attack and then understand, start to come up with new controls that you can put on your other production environments. As a messaging person, we used to do this all the time with what we had on the edge called the SMTP relays. SMTP mail messages would come into the network over one of these relays that would then securely relay it uh, to a backend server. Well, these SMTP, since they were on the edge and not very well protected, they were constantly under attack. A hacker didn't really have to crack this. All they had to do was stop it responding, and that would cause me a mail outage. So it basically a denial of service attack. Well, we used to put up several of these so that a hacker would go hit one of them break it, we could do the analysis on it, figure out how they did it, or at least how to prevent it on the other ones so that we could maintain and continue service. Um, so it's, a, mis it's a, a misdirection from other production servers. You might even kind of highlight it more to the hacker. You know, you don't want to say this is a honeypot. You just kind of want to make it, yeah, this is one of our production servers and people will attack it. You get to analyze those results and come up with better mitigation procedures. Now, part of this is the definition between production versus research. And notice what I was just saying with a honeypot. I'm going to, I just gave you an example of putting this into a production environment and it itself was a production server, the SMTP uh, relay server. That is where you are doing a production level honeypot and you're allowing it to be attacked so that you can research it and you've put controls around it to safeguard it as much as possible, and you've turned all the logging on so that you can do the analysis. That's a little bit different than a research honeypot. While the production ones are part of the actual network, research ones, well, they're not supposed to provide any kind of value or service to the production network at all. As a matter of fact, they're just there for research. And I've done this where I've set up a, a research environment product that even uh, the, the company I was working for at that time wasn't working with. And I intentionally created this environment just so I could see what would happen to it. As we were studying um, applications that we wanted to purchase, this is a common time where I'll take that application and put it into an environment where I can see what's going to happen to it and some of the vulnerabilities to it. That research allows you to study it, then you can make decisions from there. Are you going to look at mitigation controls? Or maybe this is going to help you with the product decision. Maybe that's not the product you wanted to use. Another term that you're going to hear are honey nets. And there are both production and research versions of honey nets. Honey nets are entire networks that are filled with honey pots. The idea is to make it look just like the real network and all of its operations. So you can have applications and services running. You'll have user accounts. You may even have simulated traffic on it so that when a hacker goes into it, they think this is the operating network and they will start to do their exploits and they will go through their particular process of exploitation and they have their own steps to go through and they will start to do these and you can monitor them as they go through these steps. You can see how far they get. You can see if they're successful or not successful and at what part of the process or what particular control finally shut them down. Now, I, I do have to say a lot of times uh, honey nets are created, you know, this could be a real expensive proposition if you think about it, right? But this is one of the great things about virtualization is that you can create these honey nets that are all virtualized and, and uh, reduce the cost, but still have this environment where you can see what's going on. This is a great way to test some of your environmental controls and some of the your applications, because it really dials into, hey, I want to know, I've got this application and I'm going to have confidential data located here. Is somebody going to attack it and what are they going to do? And I want to be able to monitor this. So part of your events of interest are these honey pots and honey nets to check for weaknesses. 
Quite honestly, I think the decisions made about logging, what you're logging, what devices you're going to be doing the logging from, the source systems that they come from, I think some of these decisions are some of the most important because it helps you not only in the monitoring process, but also as you're working in the troubleshooting and, well, detection process as well. We looked at logging, the different types of logs that you can have, and the difference between passive and active logs. One of the important aspects to this was being able to do as close to real-time logging as possible, regardless of what particular device or platform you're responsible for. You want to get close to real time because when an event occurs, you want to see as much data as possible right up to that event. Now, we also are going to have lots and lots of applications and devices that are generating logs. And so trying to bring this back to a centralized lo location is really important for the analysis. Now, we talked about some of the things in the events of interest like SNMP that you can get a centralized manager for when you're using SNMP logs. Your um, intrusion detection system can centralize logs. You might be working with a particular platform, and I, I gave the example of working with Windows servers and enterprise applications where you can have something like System Center Operations Manager that can grab this logging information and can bring it back to you. Most of these logging environments also will let you create your own triggers and can have some pre-created triggers so that you're not gaining too much information. In other words, you're not getting the I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine kind of stuff over and over again. And along with those events of interest, we talked about dialing into, well, just like that, what is it that you need that you want to gain from? So SNMP is configurable for that, your intrusion detection system. We looked at honeypots where you're creating environments that you want people to attack so you can start to discover how better to control against that. For, for the most part, logging, I think you'll agree, is it's a very, I, people think it's boring. I actually think that logging is exciting because this gives me the information I need to do a better job overall at both my risk management, my risk assessment, my analysis, my treatments. It allows me to see how those controls are working. I just think that this is a pretty, pretty cool aspect to it. Well, we have one last thing to do in this course. And that's going to be to take a look at the monitoring results. So we've collected all of this and we've already started talking about the monitoring results, but how can we see these results and do an analysis on them? And, and in general, we want to start to look at, well, what are things like trends and metrics that I can use and visualization techniques? All of that good stuff comes up in the next module on analyze monitoring results. When you're collecting all of this log information and you've got your monitors running and you're gathering all this data, it helps to know what to expect from this data, what kind of things you're going to see. And then I want to give you a couple of simple examples of gathering that information. Now, one of the first things are you're going to run across alerts, and that's what uh, is common when you're collecting event data. These are automated messages triggered by predetermined events, usually built already into the product. So whether you're working with a network device or a particular operating system or application, it has already been programmed to generate a series of alerts. However, one of the things that's very important is that you can create your own custom triggers in many of these products. So if you have particular alerts of interest, and I'm gonna give you some examples, you can dial the, 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 the monitoring tool in further so that you can gain those particular alerts. Now, of course, it, it does matter that you have to understand the product and know what you're going after for these custom triggers. We don't want to gather more than we need because we're going to be dealing with large amounts of data. So creating custom triggers is often a great way to kind of dial in what you're looking for. Now, when you get an alert, there's going to be different alert levels. And quite honestly, it's going to be different for everything that you work with. Um, so you'll have to check that particular product and what kind of alerts that it gives. Or you'll hear people say, well, what kind of level of error messages um, does it have? And you know, the simplest way is red, yellow, green, where, well, you know, red means bad, yellow means, uh-oh, caution, and green means, oh, we're all good. Now, 
Some uh, products will do a very simple alert. Let's just say like a service is running, like a Windows service, like on your laptop or something. That service can be running, it can be stopped, which would be red. Running would be green. It could also be paused or it could have some, uh, it could have hung as part of the process, which would mean it would turn yellow. Now, this is good, but oftentimes you need more details than just red, yellow, green in your alerting levels. So many products will put something, uh, they'll create more alert levels to it. Critical, which means it needs immediate attention. Error, which means something went wrong that you should review. Warning is there might be something going wrong and just general information type of alerts. Now, general information uh, alerts, and a lot of times this is gathered and you might ignore this general information, but still sometimes during an analysis, that general information can be useful, although it, it, it specifically means there's nothing for you to do. There's nothing for you to worry about. It might just be as simple as a message going, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good over and over again. Now, the more complex the system or different devices will um, also have alarms. Now, alarms are, you know, you can think of them like an alert, but an alarm is usually something that is super critical and it requires immediate attention. And I, I used to work in, <laughs> this was kind of annoying, um, the, uh, I used to work in a data center where they had one of those uh, it, it, almost the size of a fire alarm bell and it was a mechanical bell and when certain critical alerts were triggered that bell would go off now that's a way of grabbing your attention but it was also it could be misused and we're going to talk about the the false positives here in a minute but i want you to think about this the only time i want that bell to go off is, well, like if there's a fire, um, th it's got to be super mission critical. Now, in the case of this data center, it was a large data center, and they had a lot of service availability to mission critical customers. And if that availability stopped functioning, everybody needed to know about it immediately. It couldn't wait for um, some other trigger or somebody to review a log. So you can have very mission critical alarms that go off. Although there might be a better way to do it. I know that many years ago, it used to be that certain critical alarms, instead of ringing a bell, because we're much more remote now, um, would make my pager go off. Um, I, I know that just dated me, but um, my pager would go off. Or today, I will get uh, a, a text message on my phone for critical alerts. So these kind of alarms can be set up with many products. Now, let's talk about trends though, and I'm gonna be showing you a couple of examples of this, but trends are very important. So if you start to look at your data, your log data, your event data, whatever alarms you've been getting, and you look at it over time, that can reveal a lot of interesting information to you. First of all, it can help troubleshoot things or alert you, or I shouldn't say alert you, it should raise your awareness that maybe something is going to go wrong. It also works well for planning information. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you've been monitoring your disk utilization on one of your storage devices. And so you've been watching this over a period of time. And what you found is that every month there's a 10% increase in the disk space that's being used. Well, if you're seeing this for a couple of months and seeing that there's a 10% increase in the usage of the disk space, you can start to plan for when you need to increase that disk space. We do this often as we look at specifically like hardware upgrades, storage upgrades. You know, we can plan for these things. And what that allows us to do, the better we are at doing this kind of trend analysis, it allows us then to budget for those, those needs or those upgrades. And also it allows us to make decisions like, well, we don't need to upgrade this. In other words, we've got a storage device that's been maintaining 50% of free disk space for the last six months. We don't need to include a, an expansion in the current budget for that because we're not utilizing it. So it allows us to both spend money and, and, and focus on areas of concern uh, a lot better if we do this kind of trends analysis. Now it helps if you have a product that can do this and we're gonna talk about that as well. One of the things though that comes up quite a bit is this concept of false positives. 
And I've certainly run across this. This is when you're getting um, an alert, but it's not really a problem. And this happens from time to time. Um, it might be uh, it might be generated by the monitoring application itself. In other words, the application has been set to trigger off critical alerts or you know uh, error alerts every time that it thinks there's a hiccup. So you get a lot of these alerts when there's not actually a problem. The other time that this this happens, and this has happened to me quite a few times, is where an administrator will um, create an alert because they feel that it's important when it's really not. Now, let me give you an example. I worked with a guy who every single time a person logged into the system, he wanted to have a displayed alert on the IT administrative machines, alert that would literally pop up and say, so-and-so just logged on. Now, you might say to yourself, well, knowing how many people throughout a day, throughout a week, throughout a month log on to the system, could be a performance tracking event. Yes, that's true. However, we have performance tools that will track that information for us, and then we can go back to that information and then analyze it. I don't need something popping up on my screen for something that's not a problem. The network is supposed to let people log on. And so what was happening was, is these alerts were constantly popping up for something that was a normal event that was supposed to happen. Well, this starts to create a problem. So if I'm getting alerts popping up on the screen all the time for things that aren't a problem, combined with alerts that might be popping up when there is a problem, I'm going to start to get into a pattern where I'm just ignoring and canceling the alert that's on my screen. So what's happening is, is that people are being taught to ignore the alerts. This can happen in several situations. So you really got to be careful about this. If we want to have some kind of an alarm, it needs to be for something that requires an immediate attention. Um, and usually you will see this around critical errors and just errors. Warnings and information kind of levels, you don't often see that around. But you need to be careful about how you're delivering those alerts. And as you're trying to work with this information, one of the things that comes up is how do I gather it? Well, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. One of the ways on many systems, both Windows and Linux as an example, or other devices, you can gather alerts from a command line. Now, there's a lot of flexibility at command line, and there's a reason why a lot of people like to use command line. First of all, I can gather, in this case, event information from as many systems as I want. So I can do it all at once. This is, you know, as we were talking about gathering uh, log information from several systems at once, bringing them to a centralized location so that we can do analysis on them. This command line allows me to do that. And I also can do things like I can filter just to the things that I want to see. In the case of this command line, it's really simple. It's checking a Windows system log for errors and only showing me the latest five that have occurred. Now there's other ways to do this. You can do this with graphical based programs. And what graphical based programs um, offer you is they may not offer you the ability to gather from multiple systems at once. That's one of the drawbacks um, to it. But it can allow you to quickly see and scan sometimes faster. If you take a look at the graphical that's up there of Event Viewer, you can see I've got some information alerts and a couple of warning alerts. Well, those yellow warning alerts just leap right out. So I can start to see the information a little bit better as I'm trying, as I'm gathering that information. And it might help warn me that there's something that I need to be paying attention to. So you get both command line and graphical based programs that can help you gather this information. But the real question is when you get an alert that you're concerned about, how do you find out information about it? Well, this is where most of your logging information will tell you where it came from and also give you a message about the alert and probably it'll give you a unique ID. Let me give you an example. If you take a look at this particular warning that I have in Event Viewer, um, I have it selected and you can see that the source is from DNS and it gives me an event ID. And if you look towards the bottom there, it shows me the details of this. So it says, I've got a source of DNS client events. It gives me a event ID of 1014 and the level of warning. And it can also give me some additional uh, description information. In this case, it says name resolution for whatever, timed out. Um, 
so using this information, I can start to then diagnose what the problem is. But what I want you to point out is, is that many times these events aren't going to make a lot of sense. So how do you get more information on them? You go to your favorite help engine <laughs> and you uh, put in the event ID. That's the type of system that you're working on, like Windows Server 2012 event ID 1014. And of course, you're going to get back a lot of results. Some of this in the case of Microsoft will come officially from Microsoft. It can come from other people that have run across this. Now your analysis begins of what people have run across that may have generated this particular kind of alert. And this is what we do in IT, right? And the same thing, whether this is a security alert or some kind of outage alert, we all do the same thing. I also want you to notice that at the bottom of the screen, some applications will take you directly to an online event catalog that will um, show you a description of what this event means. Now, that can be useful. However, it doesn't necessarily show you other people's experience with this particular event. And so that oftentimes when you're troubleshooting is sometimes some of the best information that you can use. So don't be afraid to dive right out to your favorite help engine and take a look for what does that event mean. I've said it before and I bet you can already start to see that you're gonna be accumulating an awful lot of data and analyzing that data becomes more and more challenging. Um, it's great if you have tools to help you analyze that data, and that's one of the things we wanna talk about, but still, this analysis can become difficult. So event data analysis is the process of gathering all of that raw information from all the different sources. It could be around the network, it could be in different locations around the world, different parts of your network that are out there, bringing those results in and uh, displaying it in an understandable manner so that it can be read and deciphered. As, as an example, let's say that I, I wanted to understand the how many people over the course of a week are logging into a particular application. Now, if I just want the average of, uh, of the number of people that log into the application over a week, I can look at that as a number and go, okay, that's pretty good. But let's say I wanted to see the busiest log on times throughout the day, throughout a week. Is it busier at eight o'clock in the morning with people signing in? Do they sign in at nine o'clock? What do they do during lunch? Do they all sign out and go to lunch? What does that look like? Well, representing that in just numbers becomes much more difficult to try to understand. So we want to represent this a lot of times with graphics. And, and there's dashboards that can be created with many products to allow us to see this data. And you know what I'm talking about. Things like pie charts and bar graphs um, that you'll see being created. And either the, a person themselves is putting in the data and creating those pie charts or you're gathering that data and creating those. This creates a visual representation. And this actually ties into our next topic on visualization because remarkably, it's easier for you to understand a lot of things when you see it visually as opposed to the raw numbers. Now, there are tools that you can use for this. And one of the ones that's common in our industry is using something like, a, well, using a spreadsheet, like, and I put up Microsoft Excel. Um, using a spreadsheet, making columns, putting in data, and then you can have, like Excel, create a lot of these pie charts and pivot tables and bar graphs to visually represent this data. Now, when you start to select a tool, though, think about the amount of data that you're going to be working with you're gonna have a considerable amount of log data or uh, you know specific event data that you want to uh, try to manage and try to analyze. And because of the size of that data and also the way that you're gathering it, you might be doing real-time gathering of this. Excel doesn't do well with being injected with huge amounts of data in real time. There's a better way. And this is what I would encourage you to do is if you're gonna start doing data analysis, if your company doesn't already have something in place, which it very well might, consider setting up a database server that has reporting and data analysis capabilities. 
as as an example, I, I'm just going to use Microsoft SQL, although Oracle or whoever you want to use has has very similar capabilities. Uh, Microsoft SQL is a very easy database server for to set up, to create a database on, and then add reporting services to it so that you can get graphic representations of data. And because it's a professional quality database server and database, you can inject large amounts of data in it for it to analyze that data. And so this can be very useful and very helpful. Now, there are a lot of products that just naturally come with some of these graphic capabilities. Now, when I started using Network Analyzers, I think it was Network General Sniffer was the first one that, that I worked with. The data came back in numbers. So you were looking at packets and you were looking at numbers. Um, you didn't get graphicals. Uh, you didn't get these, these pretty dashboards that are created. Today, a lot of devices like a network analyzer or an application can do a couple of things for you. First of all, you can collect a lot of data and they will perform some basic analysis for you and then show that data in a dashboard, some sort of graphical form that makes it easier for you to visualize what's going on. Note, I just used the word visualize because that's the next topic because it, it's pretty cool. Um, so the network analyzer can do some of the analysis and then display it for you. Also, some devices, in the case of a network analyzer, they can also help you with the discovery. They could map out your entire network for you. Now, looking at a diagram then of that network mapping, and you've seen a network uh, diagram before, usually these are hand drawn by people, but when they're drawn by people, whether they're using software or they're doing it by hand, mistakes occur. In other words, they might forget about certain devices on the network. Network Analyzer can do a really good job of finding all of those and then representing it to you in a graphical form. And it makes it easier for you to understand the layout of the network. And if there's a troubleshooting issue, it can help pinpoint where that issue comes from. So the quality of the tools that you're using do matter. I always recommend a, a good database server, good analyzers, good tools that can help you build these graphics. So there are a lot of products out there that can help perform these analysis. And that's what you want to look for is things that A, can help you do the analysis. In other words, they are programmed to do some of it for you and they can graphically represent it. Now, there's a reason why this, this graphical representation, I, I keep bringing it up and it's part of our event data analysis. It's because of the power of visualization when you look at complex data graphically. So let's talk about visualization. As I mentioned with event data analysis, we're collecting large amounts of data and looking at that data in its numeric format is hard to see what's what trends are occurring. And that's where visualization comes in. And that's why I keep mentioning visualization. We talk about getting things in a graphical form that makes sense. So I just wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit more about it and give you an example a visualization. So what we're doing is we're taking complex data and representing it in a visual form. But there's there's an interesting thing is that this is taking advantage of how our human brains work. We have an innate ability to be able to look at a picture and start to see trends in that picture. As a matter of fact, our brain can process that so fast that up until recently, it was hard to be able to get a computer system like a giant mainframe to be able to even process that data. And still today, in many cases, we can process that trend information visually very fast. Looking at rows and rows of numbers, and even with all of the filtering and sorting that we can do, when we're looking at huge amounts of data, that becomes really hard to see. And think about this, networks are only getting bigger. And especially today, we talk about cloud computing and stuff like that. The complexity of the information that we're getting is only growing. So being able to take any advantages that we can, that's eh, a pretty good thing. But it is truly amazing. I want to give you an example here in just a second. So you want to look for applications that definitely assist in creating these kind of visual uh, 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 markings so that you can analyze this information. As I mentioned, like with a network analyzer, it can create a detailed visual map 
of an entire network. There are other products that can do that too. And you know, it removes human error. It helps find devices that maybe a human missed, but not just that, it can represent it so that you can see the entire system operating together. And then you can kind of zoom in to components of that system when you think there's a problem and you can understand different layers from IP addressing to the services that are occurring to the performance on particular network devices. This can be very helpful. Um, so a lot of this data that you can collect and analyze, like performance data, you can also gather from multiple applications. Uh, earlier, I talked about using something like uh, Microsoft System Center Operations Manager is a good example of a product that will go out and collect a lot of this data for you, put it into a centralized location. It can perform some basic analysis for you. It can let you know, hey, you're about to run out of disk space on this storage device, or this application is really beating up all the processors on on these servers you might need to add another processor or another server with processors in it and besides that analysis oftentimes they can give you a visual representation of what's going on so let me give you a, an example of utilizing visualization to your benefit let's say that we wanted to look at uh, processor utilization now I could do this on a single server or I could do it across many servers, but what this is is how busy is the processor? Well, one way to see this is in its numeric format. So if I'm at command line, I could have it display the information and it's giving me the percentage of processor time that's being used and it's showing me in real time, it goes down and timestamps it for me, but in real time, it's showing me what the processor is doing. Well, by looking at these numbers quickly, and believe me, this scrolls much further, um, looking at these numbers, it's hard for me to really pick out any trends. But I, I have a, something I'm, I'm about to do. I'm going to change the slide, and I want you to see if you can tell at, at this moment in time if the processor is working harder or if it's working less. Take a look. As you can tell, I'm getting a picture of that processor utilization. And you can see that the processor for a while was, was working pretty hard. But at this moment, all of a sudden, it's dropping off. In other words, I visually see it really quick that, well, my processor's been dropping off and it's, it's not working very hard. Now, this might be a good thing. This might be that, you know, I was running a particular service or application that was generating a lot of processor utilization and now that process has ended. It also might represent something bad. Hey, this server normally operates at almost 60% and suddenly it's dropped off. That means something's gone wrong. So I'm doing this trend analysis, but it's so much easier to see a visual representation of that data. So that's why you want to kind of look at products that can show you that data in a visual format. Once you have all this information, in regardless of the form that you have it in, numeric, or if you have it in graphical, you have to be able to communicate it. And I know we've talked about this before in the sense of, well, you have to communicate this as part of like the risk management process of who you give this data to, but it's not as easy as you might think. And you need to think through who you're gonna give this data to. And there's a little bit more to it than that. So first of all, who are you going to communicate to? So think about this. The chief financial officer is probably not interested in your packet analysis that you got from your network analyzer, but they may very well be interested in the performance trends on the network for a specific application that could impact customers. In other words, they're thinking about why am I going to spend money on an upgrade? I'm going to show them the impact to the performance on the network and why we need to upgrade. I'm not going to show the individual packet analysis that I was doing for it. So not only who is the type of person and what kind of information do they want, but what is that data that you need to give them? And so understanding just those two pieces sometimes is a little bit challenging, especially when you're new to both information security and IT overall. And then how is it best to communicate that data? You know, if you are doing a packet analysis and you think you found a switch that's having a problem on a particular port, 
you know, I'm the kind of guy where you come to me, I want to see that packet analysis. However, if you're doing that and you think there's a problem on a particular port on a switch and it needs to be fixed, upgraded or changed out, somebody at a higher level may just be interested in the cost in order to do that. So, and how do you show them the data? Do you show them as the packet analysis or do you show them, well, here's what's happening. It's causing these performance issues you can see on this chart. It's decreasing our performance. So it's valuable to, for us to change it out. So as you're thinking about these things, I wanted to give you a couple of examples. Like most executives, they're not going to want lengthy, you know, you know, big documents of, of information. They have a lot of things they need to be able to deal with and clear on their plate. So a lot of times they want a brief summary or often known as an executive report or an executive summary. And these oftentimes will include a lot of those graphs because they can quickly and easily see the trends that you're trying to represent. And they don't necessarily need to see all of that in-depth detail. Now, if they request it, certainly you want to provide it. But most of the time, they don't really need to see it. Also, they may be very well interested in, you know, compliance reports. This is very common um, and a simple whether we are in compliance or not in compliance in whatever particular regu regulations you're dealing with can be very useful to them. Now, this is different than, let's say, a particular application admin. And what I mean by application admin are um, uh, people that have specific applications that they are responsible for. So, um, an email administrator or an email engineer, um, is going to be interested in different types of information than let's say a database administrator. So they want information that's specific to their application. And most of the time that revolves around reliability and performance. They want to know if there's any outages, any problems with that, or if there's been a degradation in performance so that they can start to plan the things that they need to do. I know that as a as an email uh, engineer, one of the things that I'm really concerned about is mail flow. So how is the mail flowing through the system and what's the performance of that mail flow? Is there any outages in that mail flow? That's a continuing thing that I'm worried about. Now, that's not to say that I'm not worried about security information like intrusion and detection. But that's what I have security guys for, right? Is to help me with that intrusion detection, a subject that they know, you know, really well and maybe better than I know as the uh, mail administrator. And they have the tools and the monitoring capabilities to do that. So it's not that, I, you know, an exchange admin isn't concerned about security. They certainly are. But from a day to day basis, you want to dial into the specific things that those application admins need. Now, network admins, and this is a, a, a very general term, right? Network admins range from server admins to people responsible for network devices. It could be security um, related. They too are certainly interested in reliability and performance um, of those network devices and of their servers. And then there's the security specific professionals. And of course, while we are concerned, you know, the CIA triad, the, the you know, uptime, the availability is certainly a part of our purview. You know, we are really looking at intrusion detection and the monitoring of our controls, especially in this risk management process. So if I want to supply some data to a security professional, I want to supply them the information about the controls that they've used to mitigate their risks. And I want to be able to supply them information like from the edge services like firewalls on intrusion and detection. So when you communicate findings, know who you're talking to, what kind of data they might be interested in, and what's the best way to represent that data to them. Some people are going to want the hard, cold, raw facts. Some people are going to want to be able to look at a picture so they can easily see trend analysis and they can visualize it easier. I'm often asked, what's the most important thing about risk management? And the answer is pretty simple, that you perform risk management. Uh, and we've, we've talked a lot about this throughout this entire course. But in this module, we're looking at the most important aspect, I think, to risk management, and that's monitoring and being able to analyze that data when you get it back. You know, you might have missed a security control to mitigate a particular risk. It happens. But if you're monitoring and analyzing that data, you can see 
when that event starts to occur. You might get a warning about that event. You might be able to even react fast enough to prevent that event and get some controls in place. Or at least if the event does occur, you will now have it recorded, you will understand it better, and you'll be able to add that to your risk management process. This is why it's so important to not just monitor, but to review and be able to analyze that data. And you can see from the things that we've talked about, first of all, we defined a lot of the things in security analytics, metrics and trends, things like alerts and alarms. And one of my favorite things is the trend analysis, looking at those events over time. And we talked about the data analysis and the visualization, collecting this information, figuring out how to drill deeper and get the definitions of what an event ID is, and then how to put this data into a more useful form by visualizing it. And with the pie charts and the graphics and being able to see that data so that we can determine if we're, we need to troubleshoot something, if we need to start to plan for an upgrade, that type of the analysis is very important. And of course, once we have that data, we need to be able to communicate it. We need to be able to let the people, the stakeholders, those people that um, are responsible for particular applications or the budgeting of upgrades or security, we need to be able to provide them that information that we've discovered and in a form that is useful to them. If you do this, then you're ahead of the game in your risk management process. Like I said, you're able to react and you know, find, you know, see if your controls are working the way that you expected, and you're able to provide useful information to different components of your IT administration staff that can provide them the kind of information that they need. Well, you know what, this has been, uh, in this course, a lot of fun working with risk management. But one of the topics that we talked a lot about, and we didn't go into details, we just kept mentioning it, you can mitigate a risk, but still that risk might happen. So you need to have incident response and recovery. In other words, what are you going to do if it all breaks down? And that's what we're going to do in the next course. So coming up in the next course, incident response and recovery.